Tonight we're going to look at the divided monarchy. Last time we met, we spoke about the united monarchy under Saul and David and Solomon. Then something goes wrong and we end up with a divided monarchy. We see a northern kingdom, we see a southern kingdom. And that's something of what it might have looked like. We aren't exactly sure to what extent the boundaries of each kingdom went at this stage. If we sort of just divided up David's kingdom according to what was said in the book, this is what we end up with. And this part of Israelite history can be rather confusing because we've got God's people, Israel, the Israel, which is now split into two kingdoms. One is called Israel, and the other is called Judah. Now, God's chosen people is Israel, but the nation that Israel will, the plan that he's got for Israel comes through Judah. Um, so it's starting to sound like some of our politicians' reasoning, you know. <laughs> This way, that way, a bit of back here and then pop it into forward again. It's a bit confusing. But there is some reasoning behind all of this and we're going to get into that uh, tonight. And I'd just like to say that from the beginning, God is in control. His plans and his purposes are always perfect. So this split didn't catch him unawares. It wasn't something that he wasn't prepared for. It wasn't that God's plans were starting to crumble and now his plan for Israel had become shaken by man not doing what mankind was supposed to be doing. If you read your Bible, you know mankind seldom does what man is supposed to do. And we still have salvation in Christ Jesus. Amen. You know, we, we can do what we like. We aren't ever going to thwart God's plans. They're always perfect and he's always in control. Likewise, all of God's covenant promises to Israel still stand. It's not that they aren't being fulfilled or that they don't get fulfilled. It's not that there's a brief pause in the covenant. His covenant with Israel still stands. Remember, though, there's a condition to the covenant. Israel needs to be faithful for them to receive the covenant promises. And the reverse is also true. If they are unfaithful, the curses of the covenant apply to them. This is the beginning of, of that. The other part of that is exile, which we shall get to, God willing, next time. And I think, as with Israel, as we've been discussing, there's a pattern here that is very evident in our own lives sometimes. We think that God isn't keeping his promises to us. We think, I'm not blessed because things are going wrong. You know, my kingdom's being split up. I'm struggling with this and that. God's not helping me get my things worked out like I want them to be working out. But God's plan is always perfect. And God's not going to leave you. He's never going to let you go. He's never going to forsake you. He's never going to forget about you. He's never going to stop loving you. And how much truer if we are in the body, if we know that he is with us, if we know that the Holy Spirit is leading us and guiding us. Just quickly, what's the gain on this at? Just put it down to like 8 o'clock. because it's, it's picking up every little tap that I do. Thank you. <laughs> okay. The divided monarchy, monarchy. So, like I said, hopefully we'll be quick tonight. I'll try to go through this quickly, but in a fashion that makes sense as well. <laughs> what led to the split? This is an important question that we need to ask. And I see two things that are obvious here. Firstly, unfaithfulness to God. Remember last week, uh, last time rather, when we spoke about the United Monarchy, how much struggle there was in the United Monarchy. Saul was off to a rocky start. David got off to a rocky start. Remember, he kind of, there's a civil war before eventually the ten tribes came to him and Judah and said, okay, look, we think you can be the king. And then David was, you know, ruled, presided over this majestic kingdom for a while then he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then there was turmoil in the latter half of his reign, uh, one of his sons trying to usurp him and all that kind of stuff. So the cracks begin to show even during the united monarchy. This happens in our life as well. Things are going well, things are going great. The cracks are going to start to show if we are being unfaithful to God. If there's the slightest bit of unfaithfulness to God, we will see the cracks. 
Now, I'm not saying that that will lead to complete split and God's not in control of that. Because as we shall get to as well, sometimes these things are necessary. But what I am saying is that in the good times, if we forsake God, it's not going to go well. You often hear of people coming to church, coming to God when times are rough, when times are tough. Fantastic. We need to seek God in those times. Absolutely. But what happens when the times are good? What happens when you've got so much money you can buy what you like? Or you're so happy with your relationships and your job? Or you, you're just contented with everything? You're not getting irritated with people that are cutting you off at the stop street? Or your coworkers are behaving nice, nicely to you? Whatever the case is, you know, all these things that make us content with life, make us happy, feel satisfied. Are we giving God thanks for that? Are we giving Him praise for that? Are we so content with life that we're making more time for our contentment that we're not making enough time for God anymore? These are the kinds of things that I'm talking about. So like we see, there's a precedent set for unity, and that's faithfulness. If you want unity, you need to be faithful. If you want unity in the church, you need to be faithful to God. And that's simple. It's because faithfulness to God means that our plans, our purposes, our desires, our goals, our uh, action plan is going to align with God's. If we're unfaithful God or to God, or rather we're more faithful to something else, then we're going to start following that. We're going to link up with that. And, and with that, you know, let's say I'm more faithful to my church denomination than to God. Then I'm going to pursue the aims of my church denomination above those of God. And so, you know, so-and-so is always correct, and this is always a way to do it. But what about somebody who believes something a little bit different? Or somebody who thinks you should use plastic stools instead of wooden stools or something like that. You know what I'm saying? Then there's going to be division. But if we're unified and following God's goals and God's purposes, we can all get behind that because he's given them to us. He set them and laid them out in his word as he's revealed it to us. We know what he wants. We know how to follow him. So let's follow him. And let's follow him in unity. Anyways, we know that Solomon was not faithful to Yahweh, the Lord, towards the end of his reign. There was no indication that he would suddenly repent. There was no indication of like a, a David kind of figure who would take over. At the end of Solomon's reign, we can see things are going badly. And we pick that up here in 1 Kings 11, 1 to 13. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidians... Sidonians, probably, and Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them. Why? Because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. What happened to Solomon? He forsook his God because his wives turned his heart away from God. Nevertheless, Solomon held them fast, or held fast to them rather, in love. He had 700 wives of royal birth, 300 concubines, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, his God, as the heart of, his David, of David his father had been. He followed Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did not follow the Lord completely as David, his father, had done. On a hill east of Jerusalem, Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable god of Moab, and for Molech, the detestable god of the Ammonites. He did the same for all his foreign wives. All of them. Imagine 700 idols set up across the land. And he burned incense and offered sacrifices to their gods. The Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. 
Do you see how the writer keeps hitting back this point? Here's the Lord. Solomon did not follow the Lord. Solomon did not, was not fully devoted to him. Solomon was not faithful to him. His wives led him astray. His wives had other gods. God told them, you must not do this. Solomon did this. So if you're in any doubt, Solomon was led astray. Solomon did not follow God because God told him, if you do this, you're going to be led astray. And what happened? He got led astray. So the Lord said to Solomon, since this is your attitude and you have not kept my covenant and my decrees, which I commanded you, I will most certainly tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your subordinates. Nevertheless, for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it during your lifetime. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Yet I will not tear the whole kingdom from him, but will give him one tribe for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. Very important. One tribe for the sake of Solomon, for the sake of his son, for the sake of some kind of Israelite unity. No. For the sake of David, my servant. In other words, the Davidic line, his covenant promises to David. And for the sake of Jerusalem, his holy city. His place where he decided to build the temple. And this is, you know, my holy city that, you know, I will choose to reveal myself to mankind on earth. The place that he has chosen. Very important, let's remember that. Okay, so unfaithfulness to God. Secondly, unfaithfulness to the people. That's the people of Israel, and I think it also applies to ourselves, unfaithfulness to ourselves. When Solomon died, his son Rehoboam, which is quite, quite ironic, it means he enlarges the people. <laughs> this is the chap who leads to the split of Israel, and his name is he enlarges the people. So Rehoboam is anointed king. He's accepted by both the northern and the southern tribes. Okay, so all the tribes accept Rehoboam initially. He summons the elders who tell him that Solomon had taxed the people too heavily and they were burdened. Okay, the people did not like the taxes that Solomon had had. They had a big weight on their shoulders to carry uh, this financial strain of the kingdom. And the wisdom from the elders was to ease the tax burden, ease the load. So what does Rehoboam do? He calls his childhood chummies and he tells them to assert dominance. Tax them more. Show them who's boss. Your father whipped them with whips. We will sting you with scorpions kind of vibe. <laughs> so obviously the people do not like that and they revolt against him. And they summon Jeroboam, meaning he opposes the people and they made him king. All tribes except Judah and some of Benjamin Remain faithful to Rehoboam because of the sake of David and Jerusalem, who God had chosen. And we pick up the story in 1 Kings 12, 6 to 15. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. I told you all of this, but let's read it anyway. <laughs> How would you advise me to answer these people? The people came and said, do something about the taxes. They replied, if today you will be a servant to these people, serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. Notice this wisdom from the elders who had served Solomon. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who he had grown up with and who were serving him. He asked them, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Would you like me to explain that one to you? Little finger is, is thicker than something that belonged to Solomon. So that's a very insulting thing to say. <laughs> this is your, your father that you're speaking about. My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam as the king had said, Come back to me in three days. The king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, My father made your yoke heavy. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people. Well, this turn of events was from the Lord. 
to fulfill the, wo- the word the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, son of Nebat, through Ahiah, the Shilonite. And he had basically told him that God's going to rip the kingdom away and give some tribes to him. So you can read the whole bit there. We're just going through it briefly. So the people revolt. Jeroboam takes charge of Israel, northern kingdom. It's also called Ephraim. Ephraim was the biggest tribe, or the most dominant tribe, rather. He sets up his capital at Shechem. Eventually, this capital moves to Samaria. Have you heard about Samaritans, Judah and Samaria? The land was kind of called, uh, or known rather, as Samaria, another name for the northern kingdom. At this point, we have Israel, and we have Israel as in uh, Judah. So the question now is, who are God's chosen people? We've got a divided monarchy, we've got Israel, we've got Judah, both are Israelites. Then we've got Judah, we've got Benjamin, and then we've got the rest over there. Who are God's chosen people? Who is God's chosen people? And I think the answer is simply this. God's chosen people are those who remain faithful to Him and His purposes. Who was His chosen servant? David. And who did he make his covenant of a messianic salvation figure, the line coming from, or the king, kingship, through which line? The Davidic line, David. Okay, covenant promises to David. What city did God choose? Jerusalem. Where was Jerusalem? In Judah. But the focus is not on Jerusalem or Judah or David. It starts with God. Who's faithful to God and who's faithful to God's purposes? Because if we start there, or rather they started there, they would realize God has chosen the Davidic line. God has chosen Jerusalem. This is where God's going. So if I'm faithful to God, this is where I'm going to be. And I'm not saying Judah was in the right here, but rather the faithful people who are in Judah, even the faithful people who are in Israel, Do you understand? God's chosen people are those who remain faithful to Him and His purposes. And that includes those faithful Israelites that were living as God had commanded them to live, as covenant people, to be a light to the nation, a light to the world. So those who were living as the Israelites that God had chosen and predestined and commanded them to be, this holy nation, nation of priests, those are the ones who are faithful to him and his purposes. Unfortunately, we don't read about too many of them. Not at least any of the common folk. If we look at Israel, all king, 19 kings that reigned in Israel were evil. That's the northern kingdom, Samaria. All 19 kings that reigned there were evil. And it all started with Jeroboam. 1 Kings 12, 26, 28, Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. Why did he think that? Was David's house powerful? Mm, Suppose so, but David's house was characterized by turmoil in the latter half of King David's reign. So why was he thinking that it was likely to revert to the house of David? Is it maybe because God had said something about David's house, David's line? And Jeroboam thought, oh, maybe we must try to get at this side instead of that side. These are kinds of things that we need to be wary of in our own hearts as well. Has God said, do this? Are we trying to do something that's not going to ha- make it happen like that because it's easier for us to go this way? Anyways, if these people go to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem, then they will again give their allegiance to their Lord Rehoboam, king of Judah. So he links going to sacrifice at the temple even with allegiance to the southern kingdom. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. After seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. Where have we seen golden calves before? He said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. <sighs> Don't go ahead with that. That's, a, that's too much slip. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. What a dingbat. 
this guy's cooked in the head. You know, he has an opportunity. If Rehoboam was being unfaithful, he has an opportunity for Jeroboam to lead God's people back to righteousness, back to faithfulness. He could have said, don't give any power to me. I don't want to be your leader. God didn't choose me. God chose the house of David. Rather, go back and sort out the house of David. Or it doesn't matter if Rehoboam is taxing you. That's where God wants you to be. Those are his purposes. Jerusalem is his holy city. Go sacrifice there. Go worship there. But no, what does he do? Here are your gods, Israel. These two golden calves brought you up out of the land of Egypt. A calf is a baby, man. It's not even a bull or a cow, it's a calf. A calf suckles from its mother. So it starts off like this. Israel just gets wiped out. You know, it starts badly. Uh, Elijah goes to minister. We'll look at them maybe as well. Um, so God sends prophets to Israel, but nothing really works. All 19 kings were evil. And as we'll look with uh, the exile, when they get exiled, the northern kingdom uh, gets carried off by the Assyrians, and that's them. They disappear. They don't come back. Have you heard about the ten lost tribes of Israel? Ever heard about that? Those are, that's the northern kingdom. They got carried off to exile and never came back. Those that remained were interbred with the local Canaanites. They became the Samaritans. Anyways, of the 20 kings that reigned in Judah, only eight were faithful. So a little bit of improvement, but not much. And we look here in Chronicles 15.10. This was King Asa, meaning healer. He was the third king of Judah, but he was the first king of the southern kingdom to return to God. So Rehoboam was bad, the guy who came after him was bad, and then Asa uh, led a revival. And we read that here. They assembled in Jerusalem in the third month of the 15 year of Asa's reign. At that time they sacrificed to the Lord 700 head of cattle and 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder they had brought back. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Notice this, this um, progression as well. What's the reference made here? The God of their ancestors. So the true God, Yahweh, the God who appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the patriarchs. So notice that linking there with all their heart and soul. All who would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, were to be put to death whether small or great, man or woman. Those who stuck with God's plans were part of his chosen. Amen? And inevitably that did not happen. Judah also fell into captivity. They got carried away to Babylon, but they came back. They rebuilt Jerusalem and the temple. The Davidic line was preserved. How do we know that? Because we were told that there was a man named Joseph, he was betrothed to a lady named Mary, and they were from the tribe of Judah, descendants of David. Did the Messiah come from the Davidic line? And we know the rest. And if we stick with Jesus, we're part of God's chosen. If we're not with Jesus, we're not part of God's chosen. It's as simple as that. So what can we learn from the split? That's the second big question for us to ask. And again, just two things here. And firstly, we have to contend for our faith. Contend can mean to struggle. You know, you contend with someone. It can also mean to assert a position in an argument. I contend that my client is innocent because he used a coupon and did not steal the item. And I think both definitions are relevant to our faith. We need, we need to struggle for it, but we also need to stand up and take a position. It's difficult to remain faithful when everybody's doing their own thing. When the world says that these things are right and God says these things are wrong. And everyone's against you because you stand up and say, oh, this isn't right. This is not part of God's plan. 
It's difficult, but we must contend for it. Keeping faith is difficult. Keeping this position of faith is difficult. Asserting our position of faith is difficult. But we have to do it. We have to do it. God has shown us through His Word, and I'm sure you can personally account for it too in your own lives, that trusting in Him and believing in Him, living by His ways, is worth contending for. Does anybody feel like it's not worth contending for his or her faith here this evening? We need to contend for it. It's not a question of is it worth it or not. It's a question of how dedicated are we? How committed are we? How intentional are we about contending for our faith? Jude 1 verse 3, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So we can talk about our common salvation and all that, but are you contending for it? Are you fighting for it? Are you asserting a position and standing up for it? 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of the faith. The New Testament is full of military metaphors. We are soldiers in God's army. Put on the armor of God. It's a fight. But not against flesh and blood, against the powers and principalities. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In other words, People know that you are a believer. People know that you're fighting the good fight. People know that you're striving for eternal life. You initially made that good, good confession. It's worth it. It's not a bad confession. It's not a maybe confession. It's a good confession. Are you taking hold of that eternal life? Are you taking hold of that position to which you were called? Luke 13, 24, Jesus says, strive. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Probably because they're not striving for it. Or because they've gone to the wrong door. So we need to, con- we need to struggle for it. But we also need to take a position in the battle between the kingdom and the world. We need to contend that God's ways are best. Take His side in the battle. We must assert our position of faith and we must stand by our position of faith. Amen? 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. 1 Corinthians 10.5 We destroy arguments every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. 2 Timothy 4, 1, 2. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead and in the view of His appearing and His kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Friend, there's no, there's no excuse There's no excuse for not standing up for your faith. There's no excuse for not defending your faith. There's no excuse for not standing up when things are going wrong and you know you need to say something here. There's no excuse when somebody's saying something that's false, especially if that person is claiming to be a believer. We are commanded to correct and rebuke and encourage with patience, careful instruction, Do it with gentleness and respect, but we must do it. Solomon did not contend for the faith. He married 700 wives, and at the first sign of them turning his heart, he flopped. He turned. He gave up when he found he desired foreign women. It was too difficult to remain faithful to God with all these interesting and exciting new gods and idols and trinkets. Rehoboam did not contend for his faith. He completely ignored the plight of his people. If he was a good king, he could have thought, well, 
Maybe it's a good idea to ease a tax burden because, you know, I need to listen to the people. I need to encourage the people. I need to build them up as God's people, as God's chosen. I need to lead them as God's chosen. We spoke about that too a couple of weeks ago. A leader to lead God's chosen people. Jeroboam had an opportunity to lead a great revival. When the tribes chose him out of revolt, he could have led the people back to God. He could have put pressure on Rehoboam to respect God's plan for the nation and the monarchy. He even invented his own religion to prevent people from returning to God. We have to take a position and we have to defend it. Let that position be firmly on Calvary's side. We know who he's going to be judging at the end of time. We know what the sentence is for those who are outside of Christ. But we know what the sentence is for those who are in Christ. Eternal life celebrating his presence and glory. Amen. Secondly, God will preserve his remnant. And I want this to be an encouragement to you tonight. God will preserve his remnant. And that means sometimes God has to cause divisions or severances in order to preserve his remnant. Imagine if Israel had not been divided, they would have been led totally astray by the likes of Jeroboam, disappeared into exile forever. Sometimes God also allows bad people to carry on what they're doing because he uses them to carry out his purposes. We know this stuff. Think of Joseph, what God intended, what you intended for harm, God intended for good, talking about his brothers. If Rehoboam was wiped out early on, the Davidic line would be in trouble. Jerusalem would be in trouble. And the faithful remnant of those faithful to God might have faced persecution. So I want to ask you, are you faithful to God? Are you contending for your faith? If so, are you also facing difficult times? The enemy is coming at you from all angles. Divisions occurring in your families, in your relationships. Opportunities seem like they're being wasted. The waves of the ocean are rough and the storm is fear. But remember, God will preserve his remnant according to his purposes. And if you are operating according to God's purposes, you can know that his plan is perfect. You can know that he is sovereign. You can know that he's in control. And you can know he will preserve you because you're part of his remnant. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3, The Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Psalm 101, uh, 7 to 8 The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Psalm 37, 28, For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. We've heard this again and again. It's difficult to believe, especially when things aren't working out. When things aren't working out the way we want them to. My dad spoke about this this morning, the tragedy that we've had in our own family you know, in the last six months or so. I'm sure you're aware of it. But the goodness that has come from that, the preservation that's happened from that, things might have been very, very different if the marriage stayed. And though it seems like a horrible thing to happen, new life has been given to a person who was repressed. I'm, I'm not saying God causes divorce and, and that. I'm not saying he causes these things. Despite these things, God preserves his remnant. And sometimes God does cause these things to preserve his remnant. If you read in that, in 1 Kings uh, chapter 11, 12, somewhere there, one of those further on in those passages that I put up there, um, Rehoboam uh, says, let's go attack the north and bring them back to you know, the south or something. And uh, God says, to, or he consults the elders or something, and God says, don't do that. I've caused this thing to happen. This is my doing. And it's difficult to believe that. But as we know, we need that eternal perspective. We need that godly perspective. Because when we start to focus on the things of God, 
when we start to understand that things aren't for now, but for eternity, we'll remember what really matters to God and we'll start living like that. And by extension, we remember that He will preserve us. Let's be part of His remnant. He will preserve. Even if things collapse all around us, He will preserve His remnant. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? God will preserve His remnant. Think of yourself as one of the faithful Israelites at this time. You are God's chosen people. You're one of them. Now your kingdom split. We know what happens. We know the end of the story. We've got the Holy Spirit now. But imagine being in that time. Things are collapsing all around in terms of the covenant. Do you believe that God will preserve his remnant? So to conclude, all those who remain faithful to God are part of His chosen people. We must remain faithful by contending for our faith. That means struggle for it. That means take a position to stand by it. Or take a position and stand by it. And we need to remember that God will preserve His remnant. Even if things are going wrong. Even if we've got a monarchy that's become divided. Sometimes God causes it, sometimes it happens. We're still living in this world. But it doesn't matter because we know that God will preserve His remnant. Amen.